Hi and welcome back to the fifth part of this Substance Painter tutorial. In this part, I will show my rendering process and final presentation edits. For the render, I will stay in Substance Painter and use the iRay render. And for the post and presentation work, I will use Photoshop. I haven't used the Substance iRay render that much, but from my past experience, I remember it's quite basic, so I should be fine. But I was quite surprised that it still lacks a lot of basic features such as custom cameras and additional light sources. Especially not being able to save a camera position and come back to it later can be extremely frustrating. I was hoping it would at least show the camera transform values so I could write it down and type it in later on. You apparently can export cameras from Maya and save it that way, but I don't want to set up a whole new scene in Maya just to save a camera position. So this time I'll work with what I got. One thing you can do though is to save your file once you find a camera angle that you like. A Substance Painter will remember the camera position. So if you are in the middle of rendering passes and happen to move the camera, you don't have to start over from the beginning. As I don't want to have any problems while recording, I already picked and saved the camera position I want to use for this render. So let's go to iRay. I won't need to touch all settings, but let's go through the important ones. The first thing I want to do is to get rid of the environment map as the background. Now let's start from the top. Since there are no custom lights, picking the right environment map is even more important. This will have the biggest impact on the final look. For this project, I feel quite satisfied with the one I'm currently using. Next is the exposure. Usually I put it to something neutral where the brightest part is not overexposed, and further adjust it in Photoshop if needed later on. But let's change the environment rotation before we do any changes to the exposure. The environment rotation rotates the environment map around the model, which changes the lighting. You can also rotate it while holding shift and right mouse button, but I prefer to use a slider once I'm in iRay, since it's easier to make smaller changes and to see where you are with the value on the slider. I will go with this rotation for now. Next is the dome and background settings. For the dome type, I'll use the infinite dome, since I don't see much purpose in choosing a size for the dome for this project. The next two sliders won't do anything, since I'm using the infinite dome. I will choose to add a ground to catch the ground shadow. I already have my position set, but you might need to adjust the y-axis if the ground is not where it should be. For reflectivity and glossiness, I will set it to black and zero, as I don't want it. For shadow intensity, I will push it all the way to one. If I want less intensity later on, I can just change the opacity in Photoshop. Now on to the camera settings. The field of view and focal length controls the same value, so you can adjust whichever you are the most familiar with. In my case, I'm more used to using focal length. For focal length, a lower value like the one I'm currently using would be very wide. 12mm in a real-world camera lens would give you quite the fisheye effect. But it doesn't look that extreme inside of iRay, and I like the way it currently looks. Sadly, I can't really show other values without messing up the camera position, but you can check it out once you try it yourself. Focus distance and aperture is used if you want to use depth of field, which I'm not going to use for this render. For active post effects, I'll be using glare to enhance my emissive a bit. For the shape, I'll use bloom. Then I can just play around with the settings until I find a good result. The viewport settings can be ignored as it won't affect the render. Next, let's switch over to the render settings tab. As you can see, there isn't really much to do here. First, I'll pause the automatic rendering so I can change the settings without restarting the render with every change I make. So here we have the minimum samples and the max samples and the max time. Since I have the time and minimum samples set to the lowest value, 
it will automatically render until the max samples have been reached. If you want to figure out how long your render would take, you could render at 100 samples, look at the time it took, and calculate the time of a higher max sample value. From my experience, anything over 30 minutes will have no big visible difference, but that will vary depending on your system and at what resolution you are rendering at. For the caustic sampler, it seems like it mostly just adds something to the ground, so I'll uncheck that. The firefly filter doesn't seem to do any visible difference to my render, but it's supposed to help in certain cases, so I'll just leave that on for now. For the final presentation image, I will probably end up using 3840 by 2160, but since I might want to crop it, and as I might need a high resolution for other purposes, I'll bump it up to 6144 by 3456, just to be sure. Before I hit render, I think I want to lower the exposure a bit, since the front side is a bit overexposed. Easier for me to increase the exposure for other parts in Photoshop than to bring back something that is overexposed. Now let's increase the samples and start the render. Now we have our first render finished, but I'm also going to render an additional two passes. As there is no real way to add additional lights to the scene, I'm actually going to render out the pass with a different environment rotation as I really want a bit of light at the front. Later, inside of Photoshop, I will blend in the parts I want on top of the original render. So let's start the render. Next, I want to render a pass without the ground to use for masking and isolating the model. Not sure if there is a better way to do this, but I haven't found one. So I'll turn off the ground and emissive and render it out. Next, I will move over to Photoshop for the final post and presentation work. Now I have switched over to Photoshop, so let's open up our main render. When opening up the XR file, I will choose to open it up as transparency. First thing I want to do is add a background color but since the file is currently a 32-bit file, I can't use certain tools such as the paint bucket tool. So I'll have to switch over to 16-bit. I'll choose a dark gray as the base background color. Let's add other render passes. Now I want to use the mask pass to separate the model from the ground for the two main renders. So I'll just hold the control key and left click on the vehicle mask layer to get a mask selection of the model. Now I can just copy the model out of the main renders and leave one ground layer at the bottom. As I want to blend different parts of the renders together, I'll add a mask to main render too. Make it black, and now I can use paint out with white where I want it to replace the main render. Next, I'll use the gradient tool to add some darker gradients to the background to put more focus on the vehicle. I will probably come back and do adjustments to a lot of what I'm doing right now. I'm still figuring out what I want to do, so I'm not too picky with details. Next, I want to create a rim light effect around the model 
since I can't really do it with lights in iRay. For this, I'll use a copy of the vehicle mask layer. I'll double click the layer and add outer glow. I won't talk much about specific settings, but as all other files and resources for this project, I'm also including the PSD file with the downloadable contents. So if you want to look at specific settings in detail, please check the PSD file. I will now add a mask to the rim light layer. Fill it with black. And now I can paint out where I want the rim light to show and how strong it should be. Since the rim light will have the same thickness all over the model, I will create a thinner and a thicker rim light layer so I can mask it out based on the distance. I also want to add a bigger but subtle outer glow to the model. I'll use the same technique, but I'll put the layer below the ground so it doesn't interfere with the shadows. Still, I will need to use a mask for this one as well. Next, I want to add some inner glow to some parts of the model. Since this layer would need to be at the top of the layer stack, I have to use another technique. First, let's create a new layer at the top of the layer stack. Fill the layer with a neutral gray color. Select the mask from the vehicle mask layer and create the mask with the selection for the inner glow layer. Change the blending mode to soft light. Now I can use the same technique that I used for the rim light, but with inner glow. To mask out where you want the inner glow to show, you can just put the layer in a folder and use a second mask. I also want to experiment with darker outlines at the bottom of the model. I'll use the same technique, but instead of outer glow, I use drop shadow. It's best not to go too crazy with this, but it can be a good way to make the model pop a bit more. I'm going to try to add some smoke or fog to the background. Usually adding subtle smoke or fog to your image makes it look more interesting and textured. I could just choose the bright color and paint directly on the layer, but it's better to fill the layer with one color than use the mask to paint with black or white by pressing X, so you can go between adding and removing the smoke more easily. I will try to add the smoke and fog brushes to the content file. In case I can't, I'll add the link to where you can find them in the content files note. Since this might take some time, let's skip ahead. I think I have a good balance now, or I might just have given up. Either way, let's continue. Next, I will use a dirt and dust texture to add some foreground details to the image. 
This file will also be added to the contents file. I'll add it to the top of the layer stack and I'll put the blending mode to screen. Now I can just use a mask to paint out where I want it. I want it to be most noticeable around the lights and try to keep it more subtle around other areas. Next, I want to add some color bouncing off the front lights. For this, I'll use a color balance adjustment layer. I will mostly adjust the highlight tab and try to find a color close to that of the front lights. Now I can use paint in the mask where I want it. To get some contrast, I will do the same in the back, but with a blue color and by masking it with the gradient tool. I keep it very subtle though. I'll add a levels adjustment layer to the top of the layer stack and adjust the brightness of the image. Next, I want to add a noise map to the background. So I'll add a new layer with a neutral gray color. Adding a noise filter. and changing the blending mode to overlay. The main purpose of this is to hide the banding that might be caused by the background gradients. I'm not sure if this is visible in the video or not, but it does help quite a bit. I also like to add it because it replicates actual ISO camera noise and makes it look more cinematic. As a last touch, I'll add another color balance adjustment layer to add some extra color. But I feel quite happy with it now, and it's probably time to call it good enough. I might do some smaller adjustments and crops to the image off camera, but other than that, I think I'm done. I hope you found this tutorial helpful, and remember to check out the resources and project files included with this tutorial. You can find the download link in the video description. Thank you for watching.